I'm Rebecca Darcy. As Jess said, if you have any questions at all throughout um, the presentation, please do ask. You know, I'm here to support you and to support your learning. I do work for the Youth Sport Trust and we're a national charity that support PE and school sport, uh, working with schools, working with colleges, nurseries, all across the board. Um, I'm also a primary school governor myself um, and we've recently just been through an Ofsted and I was interviewed as a governor. So feel free to ask me any questions on that as well. So as you can see, there's the agenda and we'll be going through that this evening. I'm going to start with a quick video. So this is just a quick video to emphasise why we need physical literacy in our schools. So the point that we're trying to bring there is that, that PE does last a lifetime and it's important that we get the physical literacy right and that's that's the role of, of our schools to do that. So understanding our subject, there are, there are three elements that we talk about, physical education, physical activity and then school sport. So PE or physical education is the planned and progressive learning that takes place within the curriculum. Then physical activity is what encompasses all physical movements. So that's that's active lessons. That's after, you know, in active lessons, active curriculum. So your PE, it's anything and everything. It's active break times. It's the whole kind of all encompassing. And then the school sport is the learning that takes place beyond the curriculum. So that's your after school clubs or teams and competitions. So the three are kind of independent pieces, but physical activity kind of is the all encompassing bit for them all. So again, this, this unpicks that a little bit further in that we've got play, which obviously is an important element in, in all our lives. Like I know myself, when I go out and do things with, with my children, um, at first you feel a little bit daunted and, and a bit daft. And then once I get involved, I'm probably enjoy it more than the children actually do. So it's an activity that, that involves enjoyment. It can be structured or unstructured. So it's often play times um, and it's, it's children using their imagination. Then physical activity, as we've talked about, is anything that's active travel, active breaks. P is the national curriculum subject. And then sport. So you kind of, your national governing body led things, your netball, your football, your cricket, um, your rugby union. And then active learning might be things like when they do active maths and, and work out calculations and, and move around to do that. So there we've got sort of five definitions that, that all form part of the physical literacy. So what's going on at the moment in, in, in our world, which obviously is the same as your world, um, we know that we've got 3.2 million children and young people that are not meeting the chief medical officer's recommendation of 60 minutes a day of activity. Um, we know that we've got 40% of 16 to 24 year olds are reporting feeling lonely. Um, and that's compared with 27% of those age 75 which for me, when you compare it with that over 75, is, is quite alarming, really. Bearing in mind those 16 to 24 year olds will probably be in college or, you know, apprenticeships. You know, they've still got quite a, a you know, they go out the house a lot to have social networks where you think that people over 75 perhaps don't. So it's it's quite an alarming statistic, that one. Um, we know that young people in the UK have the lowest life satisfaction of 24 countries. Um, that are compared those countries are compared are almost similar countries to ours so it's not like comparing us to say I don't know Nigeria it's comparing us to places like Germany um, Holland countries that are, are similar and have a similar economic kind of ranking 
Um, 67% of young people believe the pandemic will have a long-term negative effect on their mental health. So we know that we've got a, you know, a lot to do to support our young people and we can do that through schools, but it's knowing how um, these things reflect in your own school, because obviously you'll have set different challenges in your own school, depending on the type of school you are, depending on where you are, what support the children have within school, with, out of school, from parents. So this is just a general picture, but it's you know, key ways of finding out what's happening in your school and how do these things translate into your school. So there's, there's five losses that have, that have come through that have been identified in research from, from Ofsted. Um, there's losses in routine, of structure, of friendships, of opportunity and of, and of freedom. So they're all things that have come through. So again, it's putting your own school lens on this and, and how do they look and how do they translate into your school um, and onto your pupils. So it's just something to bear in mind if you're you know, going to be asking some questions about peer and sport in school. So why active recovery? Well, obviously the things that we've outlined is why it's important to make sure that we've got activity in, in our recovery as schools. Um, Barry Carpenter has done a lot of work around active recovery um, and obviously states there that the pandemic has had a devastating impact on the social and emotional well-being of our children. So it's a really, active recovery is a really positive and proactive um, way to build physical fitness, stamina and social skills through an active curriculum. So you'll see that there are five levers for recovery. So relationships, community, the transparent curriculum, the metacognition and then this and space. So all of those things, if it were talking to either your head of PE, if you're secondary or your PE coordinator in primary to see if they're interpreting those things into their PE delivery, whether it be curriculum, after school clubs and whether they're, they're factoring those things into account. Obviously, we know that every young person will have had their own kind of unique personal experience of, of living through this pandemic. Um, as, as we all have as, as adults and you know we'd like to think now after today's announcement we, we're hopefully on the way out again but we've been there before haven't we so you know it's it's important to frame it for your young people in your schools this is another video now about um, movement is life and, and why we need kind of physical activity <laughs> Our bodies are more or less the same as those of our forefathers, the hunter-gatherers. Industrial and technological revolutions happened so fast that our bodies haven't been able to catch up. We live in a world where we can spend all day not moving, and this impacts on our emotional and physical well-being. The Department of Health recommends that children do at least 60 minutes of physical activity every day. But well over half of the UK's children aged between 5 and 15 don't achieve this. As well as influence from the family, teachers and schools have a big part to play in helping children to sit less and move more helping them to understand that physical activity is the key to a healthy and successful life. Every living thing is made of billions of cells. Inside each cell are little batteries called mitochondria. These are constantly charging up, ready to be used through physical activity. If we are inactive for too long, the mitochondria get overcharged and this can cause inflammation in the cells. This is thought to be a significant contributor to virtually all long-term conditions. Inflammation can start in children as young as six, so it is absolutely essential to educate and instill good habits for children to be up and active from an early age. Physical activity releases myokines into every cell of the body. These proteins dampen the inflammation. Exercise does so much good for the body and the brain. It connects more neurons together to increase brain power. And this improves concentration, creativity and memory. 
exercise can even make the brain bigger. The boost of the immune system can last up to six hours, so it's important to exercise regularly. An active school environment directly contributes to better behaviour and improved results. But more importantly, it creates children who move around more, who are healthier, happier, better behaved and more engaged. Active children make strong students. Has anybody seen that video before? I just find it's a really useful way and it, it, it's, it's quite sciencey, if you like, or it's got some science elements to it, but it's got a really nice way. It's a great one to show to young people to almost explain to them why exercise is important and why we should value it. As it said at the end, you know, the simple message for me is sit less and move more. And I think we, we all know as adults, don't we, from through the pandemic, when you could only exercise for an hour a day, how much you really valued, you know, going out and walking for an hour and how much, you know, it improved your mood afterwards. And that's the same, whether you're, whether you're two, you know, 22 or 72, it still has that same effect on your, your mental well-being and your concentration levels. So we know that physical activity improves results. It increases, you know, better behaviours within young people. It makes them healthier and happier. And we want active children in our schools. So that's why it's important that we have a whole school approach rather than it just being seen as the, the, the role of PE. It needs to be something that comes through that the whole school. Um, obviously, you know, there's lots and lots of ways that we can do that. So looking at the house model that's on the right of the screen, we've got the foundations, which is your, your PE, your school sport, your physical activity and your, your active learning. And then it's around looking at the approaches that we take. So the content of those lessons and how they perhaps map. And can we do things that are cross curricular? Um, the values that you hold as a school um, and, and try and embed in those. Looking at the culture and ethos in school, you know, I know... In a lot of primary schools, when we had the pandemic and children went back to school, they said that young people could wear trainers for school to try and encourage them to be more active at, at PE and break times, which to me was a, a really simple win because then it almost encourages them to be more, more active, which is, has got to be a better thing. Um, and then obviously at the top in the roof there, we've got all those outcomes that the video referred to. So you can also look at it as that circular, mo circular module as well, where increasing participation and reducing sitting time is improved physical, social and emotional well-being that leads to that improved behaviour and cognition, leading to progress and attainment. So there's so much evidence out there and we know this and we know it works. But I think it's key about trying to embed it as a whole school approach and really look at it and tackling it from that avenue. Any questions so far? So this is just another uh, a model at looking at an active school. As I say, there are lots of these resources out there. Jess will share these slides with you as well so that you can refer back to these should you need to. Um, but it's about, you know, engaging in student voice. It's a huge thing. You know, at the end of the day, the young people are almost the customer for, for, for us as schools. So it's important to, that we talk to them and, and hear from them about the things that they want to see and what work for them. You know, I know myself, I'll say things to my own children and they just look at me a bit like, I don't want to do that, mum. And they come up with something else and I'm like, oh, OK. Whereas, you know, you think, I think I'm quite in touch, but I'm, I'm perhaps not. So, and again, I think that goes, that goes through to schools and, and they're there at the end of the day and that, you know, we can engage with them and, and use that student voice to make what is offered um, valued for them. We can create active environments within the school, offer the choice and variety, um, promote active travel, I know not always possible. We know that we're in a world where a lot of parents work and therefore need to, you know, take children in the car. Um, but could they stop two streets away, you know, say that congestion around school? Um, equally for, for a lot of schools, you know, have you got the scooter racks? Have you got bike sheds? You know, have you got secure places where children can use um, other modes of transport and, and store them safely at school? So it's about um, embedding and then monitoring and evaluating what you've got in place to make sure that it is working for your school. So the leading role of PE then in all of this, as, as you can see, we've got those, those five elements there and why that we need to, to look at these things. Um, 
obviously PE is the national curriculum subject and it's an entitlement for all pupils to receive PE within school, ideally receiving two hours per week. So that's the first question you can ask as a governor is, is how much PE do young people get and almost what how often is that is it are you on a two-week timetable if you're a secondary school um you know is is it on an afternoon is it in the morning you know you could ask these questions about when it's delivered and how it's delivered and, and crucially how much they're actually getting um for because for some pupils particularly in secondary PE might be the only physical activity that they do in a whole week um so it's really important knowing you know what what's being offered and obviously, again, delving deeper into PE, you know, making sure that it provides them with, with, you know, experience to learn about how their body works, learn about themselves, for them to build confidence in movement, you know, and, and also by having a really wide range of, of sports and activities that are on offer because what well, netball might appeal, appeal to one student, whereas it really might turn somebody else off PE in sport, yet they might really like doing yoga or aerobics, for example. So we really need that breadth of provision so that every young person can find something that they enjoy and that perhaps works for them. And for me, that's certainly a way then for, for later in life that they might hopefully then have that lifelong participation. But if they have a bad experience of, I don't know, cross-country running, for example, it's one that often pops up that well, us as adults go, oh, I remember doing that at school and it was awful. You know, the chances are you're not going to do that when you're, you know, 32, for example. Yeah, if you've had a really enjoyed doing a Zumba class at school, then the chances are you might go to your local leisure centre and carry that on. So for me, it's really important that we have that broad and balanced curriculum with a really wide variety of opportunities. Also, we need quality in our PE lessons. So we've got another quick video. From that video, obviously, it picks out lots of um, key things that we've already covered. I'll play it again. Um, but obviously, to try thinking about the purpose of PE in your school, is it is it still a very traditionally, you know, delivered curriculum? Does it suit everybody? And, and are all young people kind of included and able to take part? So again, perhaps three key, key questions for you to think of a goodness. You know, is it a traditional curriculum? Does it suit everybody? And are all young people? Um, able to get involved. Obviously, this next diagram, I appreciate there's a lot of diagrams going on, um, is a blueprint for a PE curriculum, but it obviously goes all the way through from early years to 16, and it's showing that it's not, you know, there is no one size fits all for a child who's, who's going through school and developing. So over on the right hand side of the progressive outcomes, you can see that we want young people to go through those outcomes of building a foundation building and developing, then developing and embedding, embedding and applying and applying and practicing. And the whole idea being is that they start off, um, you know, focusing on the needs of the learners um, fundamentally, 
and really developing that physical literacy at the early years. So very much the ABCs of movement in a fun and engaging environment to give them really those, those really fundamental skills at that early age that they then can develop and embed as they, they you know, get older and go through school. So, so much so that by the time they get to key stage four, we're preparing the students at that point so they're making decisions about what types of activity they enjoy, but they've got the fundamental skills that they can use to, to, to apply to any activities. But by that point, that they should have had such a varied curriculum that they will know what things they enjoy and perhaps the things that they are they are better at than others. So that will help them stay active when they leave school. Um, you know, it's not PE is not recreational. It's still about being taught all the way through that curriculum. And that's the difference between almost physical education and then physical activity. It, physical education is about them, them learning. Um, but however, you might have, you know, key stage three learners who are still building a foundation in some areas. And that's the point of, of our teachers knowing the young people that are in front of them um, so that they know where they are and how they can help them develop. So, you know, it's up to, it's up to teachers to decide where the focus is and where the progression needs to be for each young person, um, you know, and making it so that they can move through that. So. We believe this approach to, to PE um, with focused pedagogy that supports the journey of discovery through to you know value and will deliver the progressive outcomes that come on the right hand side. So it's really about working with you know the children to see where they're at and where they need to develop to make sure we get those outcomes on the right hand side. So taking the blueprint that we've, we've just covered, um, obviously right now PE's got a really vital role that it can play in the recovery of pupils in our schools. So it's in, you know, it might be important to ask if, if your schools, have they reassessed what they're delivering in PE because of COVID? Have they remapped any units you know, to focus on particular needs of pupils, you know, safe communication skills when they've come back to school aren't where they were previously? Have they tried to you know, change things to, to meet that? So for example, things if they're, lacking in motivation and confidence, which is the one across the bottom, you know, school might have adapted personal challenges to, to help those young people achieve their personal best and gain sort of confidence and, and engage in activities in that way. So there's, you know, various things that, issues that children might come back to school with there. And then there's suggestions of, of what can be done to, to support that within school. So it might be worth asking, you know, have they you know, reviewed the needs of the young people since they've come back after the lockdown and, and as we go through COVID? I know at the moment there are you know, various pockets everywhere, aren't there, of cases of COVID and children you know, not being at school. I think you know, it's, it's, it definitely ramped up before Christmas. I know at my own children's school, I think last week there were about 34 off across the school um, and I think about three or four staff, which is, uh, obviously has a huge impact. So it's still very much out there and still... I think very important that he is looked on to, to support our children to develop um, from where we've been. So as a link governor, we're looking now at a sort of Ofsted framework um, and specifically around PE for health and wellbeing. You know, is, is anybody got a specific role for PE? Do you want to unmute and tell us or are you all just general governors or is anybody the PE link governor? I am sort of the PE link governor. Okay. Was that something you, you requested or, or was it kind of handed to you? It doesn't matter either way. I'm just, just curious. Um, I run a lot of the clubs within school, so it was kind of natural for me to take Perfect. on that role. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Anybody else or are you all just general governors? I was the uh, PE governor but um a lot of it's been in lockdown so obviously things have changed and we use um a local uh group that that comes in and does various activities uh with with different year groups okay and that's worked really well okay now. we've now got an apprentice as well that does a lot of additional okay. work with um, after school clubs and that kind of thing so um do you feel that I'll be looking that's at, working well 
Well, I'll be looking into what they're actually doing because obviously it's changed uh, from last year, well, last term to, to this term because he's new. He's only started in September. Um, so I'll have a look at what uh, things he's been doing with, with different uh, year groups and uh, possibly see about getting involved in, um, you know, some of the groups and, and obviously looking at some of this information that you've been putting out today and applying you know some of these things to what what might be useful for for some of the uh, different kids yeah yeah definitely I think it's worth asking those questions and to see a what firstly what they're doing and b then mm. where you can offer any sort of direction perhaps and support and I'd perhaps do that in conjunction with your PE coordinator yes well because I know one of the other local schools um some of the governors there have had some uh, sort of training in sort of doing dance classes and they've introduced that with um okay. you know different year groups uh but nothing's ever been sort of talked about at our school of, of doing that kind of thing and I think that might be quite a nice thing to do to you know add some you know, dance classes and different things to get get more children active and, you know, having fun together again. Absolutely, yeah. And I think yeah. if you're willing as a governor, Julia, I'd be really surprised if the school don't want that. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll investigate to see what training they've had at this other school and see, yeah. um, you know, what, what we can do at ours. Fabulous. So, yeah. I think I know. I know from being a, a governor myself, obviously, they, they want you in school, you know, we've governed the... It, it's good it's good for the school it's good for Ofsted it, it works yeah. in a lot of ways you know it really supports and it shows that the schools a much more wider community than just the teachers the staff and the pupils mm. which they are they are a hub of the community aren't they yeah yeah so the thing to think about when we're looking at Ofsted is, is sp specifically around the quality of education right. so the intent right so you know how clear is the vision and the yes. purpose and is it understood all those questions that are down there, how is students prepared for their future? How is P yeah. inclusive? Um, is social disadvantage addressed? Is it rich and varied offer, which is what we talked about before, can all pupils be involved? Um, mm. And then onto the implementation, how are the um, student needs services? What feedback's given? And I know from the offset that, that my, my, the school that I'm a governor at just had, that was a really big thing that they picked up on the feedback mm. that's given to the students and then to help them progress. And they were particularly picked up on those that had more um, higher ability students. And mm. actually, they, you know, it, it was that they weren't stretched enough. So that's something to really to, to bear in mind. Um, when and how is assessment used to inform the teaching and how is, is the teaching engaging, exciting and innovative? So that's all around the implementation. So obviously, there's the three eyes of intent implementation and then the impact. So how are schools recording the impact? Um, what have students learned? Do the students know what they've learned? Um, what's in place to support the most disadvantaged and SEND students? And, and is it preparing students ready for the next stage? And that's very much the, the theme. Well, it's the same throughout all subjects. You know, are the students ready to, to go on to that next stage? What I can do, Jess, actually, is um, I sent some key questions over to the PE coordinator at the school I'm governor for around the offset inspection, and I'll share those as well because she said they were. We had a catch up last week, and she said they were they were useful. That'd so be really I'll, useful. I'll happily share those. Yeah. Because then again, that could be something as a governor you could use those to almost check and challenge your PE coordinator. And mm. um, yeah, yeah best if you could send through to me, and then I can circulate to everyone yeah. on this webinar. That that would be brilliant. Thank you. So this next section is around the PE and sport premium, and this only applies to primary schools. So those secondary governors that are on, apologies for, for this section. Um, feel free to stay and listen. If you want to go and grab a quick drink and pop back, then please do. But this is around the funding that goes into to primary schools. Um, we as an organisation are championing with the government to try and allocate some funding to secondary schools because we're very conscious that it all goes to primary. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but there's been nothing gone into secondary for a lot of years now. So it is something, you know, the, there's 320 million that goes into primary schools. It's a huge, huge investment um, through P and Sport Premium. So all of you will, will, as primaries, will be eligible for that funding. Has anybody got less than 17 pupils in their school? No. So everybody should receive £16,000 
and then £10 per pupil. And that's your pupil um, sport premium funding. And it's ring fence for PE and sport. So if you're a maintained school, you will have had seven twelfths in October and you'll get the, the remaining five twelfths in um, April. Um, for academies, it's a bit of a later timeline. It's uh, You get your first instalment in November, second instalment in May. So again, the, the big thing to remember, it's around, it's all about um, getting the pupils an active start in life, supporting schools to improve the quality of their PE and sport provision. Um, you can use it to develop and add to the PE physical activity and sports activity in your school. You can use it to build capacity and capability within the school. You cannot use it to employ coaches. I'm just going to have to let the dog in. I'm really sorry. You know, T for the kids. I said to him, you need to look after the dog. I even come in. So you cannot use it to employ coaches or specialist teachers to cover um, PPA time. That should come out of your core budget. Um, you can't employ people to teach the existing requirements of your PE curriculum. Um, and you can't use it to fund capital expenditure. So you can't buy things like um, a multi-use games area or you can't buy um, a daily mile track. You can't buy items like that. Um, but other than that, it's it's free reign as long as it's on peeing school sport. You can use it for top-up swimming. So if you've done your swimming, if your school does swimming through the normal kind of part of your curriculum, which it should be part of your curriculum as a primary, if you've got children that aren't meeting the requirement at the end of key stage two, which is the 25 metres in a range of strokes um, and safe water safety, you can then use PE and sport premium funding as top-up. So you can then retake them. So it can be used for that. There are five um, key indicators that it's that it's measured against um, and they're listed there. I won't read them for you. You can have a read of those yourself. So the key things to be asking as a governor here is, do you know um, where the premium has been spent? What's it been spent on? Do you know what the impact is and, and how are the school reporting that impact? The key ones are, for me are numbers one, two and three, because if you get those right, um, that will ensure that you've got some sustainability from the funding. So obviously we want, you know, things that are um, really having an impact on young people, but especially around the knowledge and confidence of staff and upskilling staff really does give some sustainability to the funding. So if you were to think, if in two years' time there is no more sports premium, almost what's left behind and what would continue and what would be, be left from that. So that's a really valuable question to be asking as a governor. There doesn't need to be an equal split between the five indicators. You know, you, you can split it however you want, but all of those five indicators need to be addressed through the spend of the sports premium. Any questions so far on sports premium? So reporting, schools must publish um, a sports premium spend report. There is a template available on our website that was created by ourselves and AFP, which is the Association for PE. Um, and there's a template for reporting on the premium and it must be online by the end of the summer term or by the 31st of July. But but for me, that should be a working document for a school. So that should be on there almost outlining your, your intention. So your intent and, and your implementation of how you're going to do it. And then as things happen, you know, almost keep adding to it and, and putting that impact in there. So it's used as a working document and it's live on your website. And that way, should you be in the Ofsted window, we know that they go on schools' websites and gain lots of information and insight beforehand. So, you know, it's on there and it's also visible for parents to see of how that funding's been spent. So online reporting must include a breakdown of what's received, a breakdown of how, how it's spent or how you intend to spend it, the impact, and then how the improvements will be sustainable in the future. But as I say, there's a really useful kind of template um, on our website that, that you'll be able to use for that. You also need to report on your swimming. And this is the, you know, you need to report how many pupils in year six at the time of the key stage two um, can competently, confidently and proficiently over a distance from 25 metres. A lot of a lot of schools um, almost fell into the trap of thinking that was it, that was all they had to report for swimming was how many pupils could swim 25 metres. But it's more than that. It's, it's around how can they use a range of strokes 
Um, so it's not just about 25 metres, it's the range of strokes. And a really valuable one is about that self-safe rescue in different water-based situations. You know, we're an island as a country. We are surrounded by water. We've got lots of lakes, canals, rivers, you know, waters, waters everywhere. We don't have to go far, I don't think, in this country to, to be near water. So that self-safe rescue and that water safety awareness is a really key thing for me. Personally, I think it's something they should cover in secondary as well, because once children get to secondary age, that's when they tend to probably go out without parents, whereas probably children at primary go everywhere with parents. So they've got that almost that safety net or carers or grandparents or whereas secondary school age children tend to go out on their on their own. And so for me, it should it should be in um, secondary, but I'll get off my little my soapbox on that one. So this is almost how it looks. This is almost the template that's online that you, you can complete. So it has the key indicator at the top and then your intent. So you can see it's to rebuild physical and mental staff through active and creative PE curriculum. Um, and then basically, the, you know, use the scheme and, and that's what they've used the funding for. So it's talking about how they're going to do it and then the impact of that. And that's pretty much how you just break it down by each thing that you're implementing as a school. Any questions on PE premium and reporting? The one thing we don't know yet, we have no announcement of, of the premium going forward, although um, the things that we're hearing from the government and particularly from the Department of Education is if anything, we think it will stay the same, but there is nothing kind of in black and white to say that as yet. It, that's just the kind of the vibe, if you like, that we're getting. So it's something to be to be mindful of. Um, and I'm sure as soon as that gets announced, you'll you'll get to hear about that as governors because it's, you know, it's a fairly significant sum that comes into school. So the Ofsted framework. As, as you know, this is what we touched on before, and it's all around that intent, implementation and impact. And then the other areas on the right hand side, behaviours and attitude, personal development and the leadership and management. And then looking at how PE fits within that and complements that. Obviously, personal development and behaviour and welfare um, are really big things that come out through PE and school sport and things that I feel that that really contributes towards. Um, the, the new framework obviously gives greater recognition, you know, for schools where to support the personal development of pupils. And again, I think, you know, they, there's so many opportunities through PE and sport to do that um, about, you know, healthy, active lifestyles, you know, learning, you know, diet, that kind of thing. It all comes through kind of the subject of, of PE. So Inspectors will expect to see schools delivering a broad and ambitious kind of curriculum um, with opportunities to be active through the school day. So they will be looking for things like lunchtime clubs, after school clubs, you know, sort of promotion of healthy eating, you know, in dining rooms, that kind of thing. And obviously around hydration and water. So we're next going to delve into a little bit more about personal development uh, and that, that kind of judgment area. And these are the things that like underpin that personal development. So the fundamental British values, citizenship, um, social, spiritual, moral, social, um, and cultural, and then healthy living, preparation for next stage, inequality and diversity. So they all come under that personal development. So, you know, obviously in terms of healthy living, we've touched on that already around fitness, mental health, you know, sort of nutrition, preparation and readiness for the next stage. That can be things around sports leadership, which can be developed at primary school in terms of, you know, playground buddies, that kind of thing. And then sports leaders at year six who perhaps support, you know, activities for the younger ones. And then into secondary school, using those leaders who perhaps support, again, after school clubs or work with the primary school to support things there or perhaps lead and officiate, at you know, sort of competitions and events. I know across Lincolnshire, there's, you know, a lot of that happens. Um, and then they often have opportunities to link to wider events that are run through Active Lincolnshire as well. So there's lots of ways that you can see and, you, and you'll, you know, unpick yourself about how people can really work with sort of personal development sort of around the citizenship. And that's about, you know, the knowledge and skills to understand 
you know, playing and, and why we have rules and why rules are important, which we have rules in sport, don't we? And, and they are adhered to and there are sort of consequences if you don't. And that all builds around that sort of citizenship um, and the British values of around tolerance and, and kind of mutual respect. A lot of schools um, have their own values within school. And it's really nice often if we can sort of align those with things within PA, um, sort of, you know, around trust, respect, um, pride, whatever the ones might be for your school, that might be a, a really good question to ask, you know, your PE coordinator of, of, of do you align those with anything? How do they map against that personal development section of the Ofsted framework? So this is similar to, to one we've covered before, but it's, again, you know, consider, consider the questions that you're going to ask at, at the next perhaps governor's meeting. Um, you know, what questions do you want to ask? How can you, you know, pick, take, perhaps take some of these off the slides and ask, I, I perhaps wouldn't go in and ask them all, all in one go, might be a little bit um, off putting for your PE coordinator and, and, and equally almost think about what, what will you do with that information and, and how can you use it you know the answers that you get to support the school to move it forward but it might be you just want to pick two or three um areas the best thing one really good thing to do is have a look on your school's website and see what's on there particularly if you're a new governor um and you're not perhaps aware of the things that are happening in school you know have a look on there and find out what you can find out you know see what's happening and if you can't find things out is it because it's not on the website or is it because there aren't things happening you know it might give you a really good a good insight into to what's there lots of schools have twitter accounts particularly at secondary where they'll share sort of what they're doing you know for for PE and sports so that could be another place to start and in, in it you know start to inform some of the questioning that you that you might want to do So for further support, I feel like I've really gone fast. Um, for further support, we've got lots of um, access to research and resources that are all free on our website. Um, there's also a Youth Sport Trust Schools Network, which your schools might be involved with. And we've also got some that's Well Schools, which is all around supporting schools to become a well. I don't know if is that I think we might have just lost Bex temporary. Can you all still hear me? Right. <laughs> Let's just give her a moment to see whether she comes back online. Let's see a bit of a blip. Oh, she's disappeared. Oh, there you go. You're back. You're muted though. <laughs> Hang on. We just Sorry. lost you. <laughs> when? I was like, everybody's gone. <laughs> I hope I'm not that bad. Not so anyway, this... Back on. Can you hear me? Yeah, can hear you. I'll, I'll mute myself. Yes, we can hear you now. You're back. Thank you. Sorry. No idea what happened there. I'm sure it's the amount of YouTube activity that's going on um, in, in our house. So... We've got the Active Recovery Hub, which has got a whole host, and that, that's across all, the whole industry of PE and sports. So there's lots of um, people that are contributing to that. So um, there's the class of 2035 research, the Well Schools Network that we've said to, and the Well Schools Measuring Wellbeing Guide. Um, one thing I would say is, as, as we just had the Ofsted, it was just before Christmas, <laughs> they were huge. The Ofsted inspector was huge about wellbeing within school. And she really pressed home was who's responsible for well-being and who's responsible for the well-being of the teachers. So obviously we kind of, as, as governors who were interviewed as a panel, we were like, well, you know, Sean as the head is responsible for the well-being of the school and as governors and chair of governors, Ron, is responsible for Sean's well-being. Um, and, and it was really, it, we just found it quite hard to articulate. It, it, it is a well-run school. They, they do have a councillor that goes in, I think, every other week who's, kind of anonymous and they can go and talk to that person <clears throat> there's lots of things in place but as governors we we were kind of aware of it maybe you know it, something that was discussed two and a half years ago perhaps but it's I think at the moment particularly with, with this COVID lens on everything I think that's something that that will get keep keep being asked because we know 
that we are losing teachers from the profession. And we know that COVID has almost exasperated that. So I think it's a really key ask back in school to think about what are you doing about, about wellbeing as a whole and particularly wellbeing for the school staff. So that's that'd be my one, you know, kind of big takeaway, really. And we, it was a deep dive in PE, which was ironic because as a PE link governor, I literally got out of bed that morning thinking, I can't wait for today. I can tell that, you know, this is my job. I, I, it's my chance to shine. Not one question did she ask me as a link governor about PE. Not one. I like to think it's because the PE coordinator had done such a good job in the morning and their website and everything was up to date that she perhaps... I felt that she perhaps didn't need to, but it, it was very much focused around that well-being for, for the questions for me as a governor. So it might be something to, to bear in mind that as, a, as that governor for PE, if you are that link governor, you might not necessarily be asked about that. So it's just about having that whole overview as a school um, and, and knowing those things. So if I just touch back on well scores, because I think this, this could be something Certainly for, for my school, I'm, I'm working with them. I'm, I'm embedding some of this and taking some of the principles. And that's the thing. This isn't a coit mark or a badge that you earn. It, it's, it's something that you embed as part of your culture within your school and make your own. Like lots of schools will have done things on growth mindset um, and embedded that within school. And this is a similar type of thing. It's something that you need to embed within the fabric of the school. So there are three pillars, well-led, well-prepared and well-equipped. So the well-led is about the staff and head teacher well-being uh, and that being supported and championed through the whole school and, and the school being connected to the wider community. Then the well-prepared is about every child having the foundation of physical and emotional literacy that will prepare them to be effective learners and cope with the pressures of life. And then well-equipped is that every child is equipped with the human skills through a curriculum and extracurricular program that develops their social capital and helps them thrive in a modern world. So that's around them having almost those character skills and that personal development. So that's something that, that might be well worth looking at for you as a school. So this is something that we have is a, a school's network. A lot of your schools, and I'll be able to tell, if Jess has already sent me the list of the schools, I'll be able to let you know if you're a Youth Sport Trust member school. <laughs> and if you are, you have access to some of our um, schools network things and we have expertise we we do they're called practice development um, we have a practice development portal has lots of resources on we do community of practice which are online kind of webinars that support schools um, which obviously governors are welcome to attend we have we, we focus primary secondary and special school and we we have things that go across all three and we have ones that are differentiated for each kind of area as well um, but again there's you know, more resources than, than you could possibly ever need on, on through this avenue. But I'll let Jess know which of the schools are in that membership category. And then if you speak to either your head of PE or your PE coordinator, they'll be able to give you access to that network. So that brings us to the end of, of the presentation. But please, now's your chance to ask any questions. Well, thank you very much. Bex, um, on behalf of Active Link and Show and, and everyone on the, web, on the webinar, thank you. I say, um, if, you, if anything uh, yeah, occurs to you afterwards, please, please do drop us a line. Um, and if not, we'll, we'll let you get on with your evening. Mm -hmm.